we're, we're going to start now, um, which means uh, Martin and I are going to talk for, for a time about his, his book, and then I'll open it up to questions. If anybody interrupts with a question, um, I will not accept his question now, then, or even later. I mean, I, I hate being interrupted. Um, if, if anyone has a telephone that can be turned off, please turn it off. Or watches that make alarm noises, turn those off. Um, and I have to ask Tim Llewellyn not to drink. <laughs> uh, and with that bit of bookkeeper housekeeping out of the way. I know, I know. Um, all right. Um, we've come here tonight to, to discuss Martin's book, After Suez, Adrift in the American Century. It might well have been called From Suez to Baghdad, but then it might, it might make you think of Tom Friedman's dreadful book From Beirut to Jerusalem. So I think it's just as well it's called After Suez. And it, it is um, a book which everyone here should read not just buy, but also read, to understand uh, imperial policy in the, in the Middle East and understanding some of the reasons why the Middle East uh, has been dependent and controlled more by outside powers than any other uh, region of the world. I mean, I mean we, India has emerged more or less independent of outside powers, and much of Asia uh, has as well. But the Middle East still seems to be under the control of foreigners. And, and he, he explains very well in this book why that has come to pass and what it has meant both for the people in the region and for the imperial actors themselves. Um, it's it's a, what I could call a tour de force. It's, it's brilliantly argued from start to finish. Um, it's not a book of jokes and anecdotes and journalistic I was there uh, heroism. It is a book of serious thought extremely well researched. It relies for some of its um, background on Suez on other pioneers in the field. One of them is here tonight, Keith Kyle, who wrote the book, the book um, on Suez called Suez. And, uh, and also a very wide, wide ranging research in, in other fields that have nothing to do with Suez, but, but he, he brings Trollope and other, others to play in his, his analysis of, of what has happened with the decline of the British Empire in the region and the rise of the American Empire in the region and how at Suez one displaced consciously displaced the other. Now I, I'm not going to talk about it too much because I want really to ask Martin about it and let him talk about it but I just thought I would, I would briefly introduce you to it because Martin is not very good at blowing his own trumpet and in fact he's terrible at it. Uh, years ago when all of his friends used to urge him to write a book. He said, I could never write a book. I don't, I don't think like that. And now he's turned around and written a better book than any of us has ever written. Now, he's a longtime Guardian correspondent and foreign affairs commentator. Um, all of you will have known him from his, his brilliant foreign affairs columns in The Guardian, and now you'll know him better and his mind better uh, through this book, After Suez Adrift in the American Century. I've made made some notes when I was reading, reading the book of the questions that I wanted to ask. So I just have to refer to my notes, which I are obviously out of order, but I'll put them back in order. Um, going very, now I need my glasses because I'm old. Um, now, Your early memory of Suez, Martin, in, in the book, you're talking about the high master at Manchester Grammar School, Eric James, discussing Suez. And the book sort of starts there. Maybe you could start there now when you were a young, when you were a young man. Tell me what he said and what you were thinking of at the time. You, now, you need, you need oh, the mic. And, you have to, and also, you, I think I have to hold it closer, too. I'm sorry. And I think have you, you well. Is this working? It is working. Okay. Well, not, not even quite a young man, a schoolboy. But this, uh, th there's always a moment, I think, in anybody's life when some major political event, domestic or international, impinges on their life and they, they become, as it were, politically aware. And for me, that was uh, Suez uh, because the uh, headmaster of the school I was at, Manchester Grammar School, had these little sessions, uh, current affairs sessions with the older pupils, the older boys, and he talked about it. He was very critical of the uh, project. 
He was very critical of the project. We, we all picked up on that. There were very mixed opinions in that uh, in northern part of England, in Lancashire, as elsewhere in Britain. We were probably uh, from families which on the whole were against the venture, but there was a certain admixture. So there was an element of stress, debate, and tension. And uh, one knew that something terribly important had happened. Uh, as I say in the book, we knew that Britain had made a mistake, uh, and we were also aware of the fact that many people thought that Britain had done something that was wrong. So it became very quickly apparent that it was a mistake. It became to many people very quickly apparent that it was wrong. And that was, that was the sort of thing which caught the imagination of boys in the school, where the, it was essentially a public school, even though it was in a northern context, where the, the, the rationale was still to prepare uh, boys for service um, in, in the, in, to, to, to meet the needs of a great power. So was this it, was rather important to us. Was it obvious early on that this was the beginning of the end of being a great power? Yes, I think it, it was obvious, but, but I, I find it difficult to distinguish between what I might have known then and what what I, I think I understand now from reading into the thing. I think well before Suez, there was a sense in Britain that the pre pretenses of Britain, that Britain was pretending to a position that it could no longer, it could no longer hold. Um, it wasn't a question of whether it was right or wrong to hold that position. It was simply that it wasn't going to, this was not sustainable. The sense that there was something unsustainable about the British the British line, the British policy, the British government's position, and that, I mean that to apply to both Labour and, and Conservative governments. So I think the sense of something slightly sham, or more than slightly sham, about our position in international affairs was there before Suez. Then, of course, uh, the failure uh, that Britain experienced at Suez brought that home with uh, a huge force. And you, and you say, you write in the book that the failure was um, both military in that the military simply was not funded and prepared for such, a, for such an adventure and also political in that the way it was done, the, the lies that were told and the, 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 the conspiracy amongst the British, French and Israelis without any American cover meant that they were both militarily unprepared and politically uh, unastute. We obviously attempted something, we and the French, that was completely unlikely to come off. Uh, judgment in both countries had slipped to the point where rational discussion and debate about policy, never mind moral debate about policy, just rational, rational debate about what was and wasn't possible, what wasn't and wasn't achievable, had more or less disappeared. And that's one of the ways in, in which uh, Iraq relates to, to Suez, but uh, I, I leave that hanging. That was, the, that was the situation, I think, in 1956. And in you, you, you quote some very good passages from a British soldier and an Israeli soldier, um, but no, no French or Egyptian soldiers. So was that just because there weren't any memoirs written by French and Egyptian soldiers? Or? I'm sure there were, but I, um, I have to say this book was written in haste. <laughs> um, and indeed there are some some such memoirs this book was written in haste and it does uh, I, it doesn't show from, well, and, and I, I didn't I, mean to point to it but it, it does not show at all it, in the writing it doesn't show it shows all. to me um, uh, but uh, yeah you, you're right to point to a lacuna there there wasn't uh, there were of course um, other experiences of the war I don't think the French experience materially differed from the French, from the British uh, in the, sort of the level of the soldiers, but politically it, it was very different, wasn't it? I mean, in the book you, you talk about the impact that it had in France, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Algeria, and it didn't feel that it had lost its status to the extent that Britain did. Maybe you could explain that. A bit. Well, I, there are people in this room who know far more about this than I, but the two countries had very a different sets of illusions, and the French illusion and the illusion on the French left was that there was a solution in Algeria uh, some form of autonomy uh, that, that was available if only 
the influence of NASA could be removed, the influence of Egypt could be removed from the scene. Um, and that was part of a larger understanding, a very false understanding, a very false consciousness, if you'd like to use that phrase, about the nature of what was happening um, internationally, in which uh, nationalism in the third world was seen as a kind of antechamber to communism. The French had a particularly forceful and vigorous version of this view. And the French army, in particular, had a very vigorous uh, uh, understanding or grasp of this. And the French army, in many ways, set, set the pace. It thought it, had un it thought it understood what had happened to it in the Far East. And therefore, it thought it understood what it should do and what it should urge its government to do uh, in the Middle East. In, in the introduction, you say that the idea of the book is to sketch how we got from Suez in 1956 to Iraq in 2003. And if, if you could, could you do that now in, 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 as, as well as you can briefly? I mean, I, I know it is the whole book, but uh, <laughs> could, you, could you take, take the... I mean, get them to buy the book, but you know, to tell them well, what, 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 it, what I you mean. I mean, there are obviously two ways. I mean, it's obvious to anybody. There are two ways you can look at, uh, at, at Iraq and Suez. You can just compare the two situations and see what's in common. And then the other thing is to try and historically trace how the two countries, uh, the United States and Britain, uh, arrived at the situation they arrived at in Iraq over the years, the half century between 1956, uh, or the less than, slightly less than half century between 1956 and 2003. As far as the parallels are concerned, I see four, um, four parallels between the two situations. The first parallel is, is to say there was deep insecurity uh, in the decision-making circles of, of both powers. Britain in 1956, the United States in the late 90s and early 2000s. This was related to genuine reverses that both powers had suffered. In our case, what lay behind us was the departure from India the unseemly uh, handover or departure from uh, Palestine, uh, the long struggle in the canal zone, um, and many other, a combination of many reverses, which meant that Britain had a real sense. Uh, I should have mentioned the, uh, especially, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Iranian takeover uh, in Abadan, even though that was later reversed in a covert operation. These were all defeats and reverses which conditioned um, British dec decision making. And they created within British politics a kind of polarized situation between people who felt these were changes which, however abrupt and hard, had to be accepted or even welcomed them, as much of the British left did, as a, an, as a necessary writing of the balance between former imperial powers and the colonies that were coming to independence, um, and people who thought that this was all about a failure of will. In the, in the early 50s and in the late 40s, the British politics was full of people talking about scuttle, loss of nerve, <coughs> loss of will. Now, there's a parallel with the United States uh, in, in the latter half of the century. In the 70s, the United States suffered three major reverses in the 70s, which we all know about, obviously, Vietnam, Iran, Afghanistan. That led to a kind of smoldering debate, particularly on the American right, about what had gone wrong. Had Vietnam gone wrong because it was a mistake, or was it a defeat? Had it been pursued more vigorously, could it have been turned into a victory? Had Afghanistan been ignored and neglected and uh, Similarly, could that outcome, which then seemed very, uh, very bad for the United States, have been, uh, have been avoided? Was Iran something that had evolved out of Iranian politics, or was it a, you know, the emergence of a, a major anti-American force, which the United States had foolishly allowed to happen and could perhaps have stopped if it had behaved differently? Out of this debate about decline, loss of control, and appeasement, because this, again, is about people saying, we could have done it if we'd had more, we'd been tougher, we'd had more will. 
and we hadn't lost our nerve. Out of this emerged the insecurity of the United States, much less justified in terms of the real facts than the insecurity of Britain and France, who genuinely were powers who were weakening. The United States was not a weakening power. Others were growing stronger, but still, the, the, com the, the, the weight uh, between those emerging powers like Iran and the United States was nothing like as adverse as I think Britain and France rightly recognized in the early 50s. So there's something odd about America's uh, obsession with decline and appeasement. The, the men who emerged as the arbiters of, of decision-making in the government which decided to go to war with Iraq were relatively young men in the 70s. They saw these defeats. They reached certain conclusions. They felt that what was needed, what Amer America had not done under democratic administrations and even under Republican administrations, was to assert itself. And so I see the, uh, the Iraqi project as essentially an act of reassertion by the United States. Um, that was, I think, what lay behind it. Behind all the detailed reasoning, both the rational reasoning and the irrational reasoning, was the idea we have failed to show who is boss, and we will now do it. We will now show who is boss by taking on this extraordinary project of going into an Arab country and turning it around. Now, there are many other aspects to this decision, but that's where it has a close parallel to 1956. The British wanted to get rid of NASA because they wanted to, to take down a regime and take it down in such a way as to have an exemplary effect on the entire region. And in, in the same sense, the United States wanted to take down Saddam in order to have an exemplary effect on the whole region. Now, there's a whole other aspect of it which I, I try to write about in the book, which is that in the sense that Egypt did not have a true, there was talk about liberation, there was talk about uh, 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 Nasser as a dictator in 1956. I don't think it was very real and I don't think it was particularly sincere not on the part of the British or the French, anyway. Um, in, in 2003, there was a genuine liberating aspect or argument to the Iraqi project. So that's a difference. But nevertheless, I think that the main motive of the people who, who made this decision to go in was reassertion, just as it was in 1956. And so that's, that's insecurity, then reassertion. Then, I think... Uh, the second main way the two things fixing on a single thing to do as the magic formula to fix things to change the situation in 1956 it was if we can get rid of NASA everything that's problematic about our position in the Middle East, French position, British position will all fall into place um, the refusal to brook argument from outside the government or even in the privileged circles of internal debate this, this was so obvious it, it couldn't be argued with. And the same in 2003. It was so obvious that going into Iraq would turn over and, and um, transform the situation that argument wasn't entertained. And people who, who said, no, maybe this isn't the way or whatever, uh, were brushed aside. So the processes of rational debate, uh, the processes of... Uh, institutional kind of pushing back and forth decisions were neglected in both cases because of this magical, this idea that there's a single magical formula, that's it, we're going to do it. And finally, there's a similarity as to outcome. The outcome in 1956 was that Britain's position, which it had attempted to shore up, was, if not destroyed, massively demoted. And the outcome, I believe, in 2003, 2006, is that the American position, which it admit, attempted to, to shore up and improve, has also been demoted, not to the same extent, but pretty significantly. And in, in both cases, um, the publicly stated reasons for going to war were not the reasons for going to war. That's absolutely true, and that's a further similarity, although it has to be said that the mendacity of 1956 far outweighed that of 2003. Well, it looks almost honest by comparison. Yeah. <laughs> in, um, actually, also, when you talk about these young men in, 
American policymakers in the 70s who saw America in decline. I assume you mean Rumsfeld, Pearl yeah. Wolfowitz, the, the people who brought the Iraq war into being. Um, they remind me in some ways, as you, as you describe them, of the China lobby in America in the late, from 1940 on, 1949 on. But luckily, the China lobby never got into power to invade China and try to reverse the, the, the revolution in China. That's true. I mean, uh, the, their equivalent in, in, uh, in 1950s Britain was the Suez Group, um, which also uh, never got into power. It didn't get into power in the sense that the neoconservatives or the conservatives got into power in, in the United States, um, but it had a, a very significant influence on events, and it, it, it affected the whole atmosphere in which decisions were taken. It never got into power. It remained relatively marginal. But its policies got into power because uh, Eden, who had resisted those policies and avoided them and uh, resisted them, um, eventually adopted them. Now, in, in the book, we get into a, a, a kind of the Manichaean view of world history um, then and now. Uh, you quote Emma John Hughes on America's addiction to, the, to using the Soviet prism to see all of the Middle East, whether or not uh, any Middle Eastern is pro or anti-Soviet and, and in no other terms. And then later, you quote Douglas Little saying greater sympathy for revolutionary nationalism might have helped to prevent America's hellish confrontation with Osama bin Laden. But in the case of um, America's hellish confrontation with Osama bin Laden uh, and not supporting, not even recognizing that revolutionary nationalism was nationalism, was not communism or not Soviet communism, um, the Americans went, went a step further, actually, and, and uh, against Nasser funded uh, Muslim groups, Muslim radio stations, used Saudi money uh, to educate Arabs to be good Muslims against nationalism and against communism, and that also helps to lay the seeds for, for what came later. It wasn't, it wasn't merely that it was um, passive, taking a view against the nationalists, but it was actually funding the other, what became the other side, which became America's nemesis now. Yes, I, I, that, that, that is true, although I've somewhat altered my opinion in, in reading and getting into this book about the relative weight of that. We certainly, we in the West certainly did uh, take a turn towards the religious because we thought they were a counterweight, and the Israelis did a similar thing. And that's had some effect. I, I now doubt whether we were actually totally the critical force in that. Mm -hmm. That turn was coming anyway, and this is a more this is a broader question about both Suez and and Iraq. I, I think it, it. I think myself, it's fair to say that things were waiting in the wings in the Middle East that were going to happen anyway. Um, so if we're to speak of today rather than 1956, I think waiting in the wings in the Middle East, or actually in the process of happening, was a, a rise of Sunni extremism. Uh, it had an anti-Western aspect, obviously, that, that because we're here in the West, that, that strikes us most forcefully. But um, as many people have rightly said, that wasn't its, that wasn't its principal uh, focus or target. It wished to change the, the region and the region's states rather than to confront the West. Confronting the West was... A, a, an ins instrumentally necessary, but it wasn't, it wasn't the primary target. So there was a rise in Sunni extremism. There was also um, a, a rise or a shift in the, in, a, in the balance of power between Sunnis and Shias coming. This is, this, is obvious, this is more obvious to us now than it was even only a year or two ago. Um, but that was in the process of happening and had been waiting in the wings, as it were, ever since the Iranian Revolution. And this, these two, uh, as it were, things waiting to happen were intimately related to Iraq because the succession crisis in Iraq was down the road at the same time. And so Iraq was almost certainly going to be the theater of a Sunni-Shia confrontation and or a Sunni-Shia settlement or rebalancing of the relationship between the, the two uh, major um, uh, uh, groups. Um, what the Americans and the British did was to 
move into this and precipitate um, certain, well, they precipitated, they, they brought it on before it would have come on. They may have brought it on, they may well have brought it on in a more intense form than it would have come on. You have to say, if you're being counterfactual about this, that at some point, had the Americans not gone into Iraq, there would have been a succession crisis in Iraq. It would have involved a, a confrontation between Sunni and Shia. It, it might well have been marked by serious violence, and it almost certainly would have drawn the leading power, i.e. the United States, in, in some way, in some attempt to manage it, take advantage of it, deal with it. So I, I think we must be very careful not to, uh, to sort of put on uh, that decision irrational or wrong as it may have been uh, to go into Iraq to put all this enormous weight on it. These things were going to happen. Um, they, were, they were part of the way in which the Middle East was evolving, developing and um, I think the lesson of the present situation is that the peoples of the Middle East uh, have to recognize that those developments are things they have to deal with themselves. Uh, they're not the product of American action. They've been complicated, compounded, and maybe exacerbated by American action, but they're not, they're not things that wouldn't have happened even had the United States been not on this planet. Now, during the uh, Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988, there were pr often predictions that the, the Shiites of Iraq would break away from Saddam and fight for the Iranians and so on. But Iraq never split then, and it was under great pressure. Why, how, did, how was it avoided then, and it was exacerbated now? An interesting question, and I don't have any, uh, I don't have any smart answer to, answer to it. Um, people are within the state they are within. Um, it was a strong state, or rather, it's perhaps fair to say, it was a fierce state. Uh, I, 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 I say very much the... The, and I can't remember who said this, that Middle Eastern states are not strong, but they are fierce. Um, and, uh, and Iraq would certainly be a fierce state. Um, so people have to operate within those structures. And then once they're in the army, um, they operate on the basis of the kind of solidarity with their fellow soldiers that always takes over or nearly always takes over in such situations. So I don't read too much into the fact that the Iraqi Shias uh, didn't, as it were, revolt. Or they were very constrained, and there were all kinds of factors which would make them effective soldiers against Iran. Okay. To, go, to go back to the, I'm trying to follow the the, the, the argument of the book. Um, I want to ask, uh, looking at Iran and the. Um, removal of Mossadegh after he had nationalized uh, the Iranian oil company uh, and looking at Suez after Nasser had nationalized the Suez Canal. Which of those two events do you think had the longer term, more important impact on the development of the history of the Middle East and, and also at the other level of, of the imperial powers? Well, it's, <laughs> it's possible now to see, it's possible to argue that the Iranian thread is more important than the Egyptian thread for a variety of, of reasons. Um, I was at a conference with Keith Kyle and others in this room recently where it was described, um, the situation was described in which American CIA agents, including Roosevelt and Copeland, uh, were talking and drinking whiskey with uh, NASA um, and when the British ambassador came to protest some particular excess of the um, voice of Britain, voice of that, the Arabs or whatever it was, I can't remember the occasion of the protest, the Americans with their whiskies in their hand retreated upstairs amid much wit many witticisms on both the Arab and the American side. Now the curiosity of that story is that why was Nasser at that point happily entertaining this relationship with the United States when he knew what they'd done to Iran in conjunction with the British. And the answer may be that uh, he didn't much care what they'd done to Iran um, and, didn't, um, and didn't grasp how that fitted in. I mean, he later turned against the Americans, but perhaps for other reasons. 
NASA's mistake we, we may also have made in not seeing that uh, Iran was a continuing thread through this whole period um, and that the enmity uh, which the Americans and British earned in Iran uh, in the 1950s is something that turned around and, be and became pivotal for the whole region with the Iranian Revolution and which, which in turn created that situation we've just been talking about in which there are major forces on the move against one another within the greater Middle East which have, have not been, um, which are internal, which are in indigenous and they've been complicated by Western action. In a sense, Iran today is like Egypt was in 1956. It is rebellious, it has assets, it is not easily touched, it has a sense of not precisely immunity, a sense that it, it, um, it's, it's, it's on the rise and things are going its way. Um, and the United States is in, in that way in, in, the, uh, in, in the relationship that Britain was with Egypt. It can't understand this uppity and difficult power. It doesn't understand why it's not open to compromise as defined by the United States. And so we have a, a, a relationship which is not dissimilar. Mm. And, and that relationship perhaps is more important than the relationship of the United States to Iraq. Mm. And is, is Iran part of American decision making in Iraq? Or, they, or, or I, I, in the book, you talk about the way American policymakers put everything into boxes. Yeah. Uh, one issue here, one issue here, as if they don't relate t to each other in any way. And is this, is this one of the things, Iraq is in this box, Iran is in this box, and the two are not in any way affecting each other? Well, obviously, I have to take them out of the boxes from time to time. Well, I think they're out of the boxes anyway. But purely, I the point for, purely, of pure, for purely practical reasons. Uh, the, the United States went into Iraq obviously with the presumption that it would have the support of the Shia uh, population of Iraq. It went into Iraq with the presumption that Iran, although not a friend, would find what the Americans were doing useful. And therefore there's a certain commonality of interest and uh, that uh, uh, Washington capitalized on that. Well, it hasn't quite turned out that way. Um, and. Uh, <sighs> Essentially, I think what's happened, as, as back in 1956, is that local powers, and in this, in this instance, particularly Iran, are not remotely as malleable as, um, as the big country once expects and thought it had reason to believe they would be. You talk, you talk about, uh, you write uh, about the assumption that the West, and this is, this is to do with um, Britain and the U.S. and Iran and Egypt and Iraq subsequently, the assumption that the West had a right to control the political development of the region. But if, if, we, are now, if we now reject this assumption, what vacuum does that leave and how is it filled? Well, that's the, the big question. I mean, obviously, you can't, be, uh, you can't be ludicrously purist about this and imagine that regions in, in the modern world uh, have some kind of total autonomy and there is, could be or should be insulated uh, from the rest of the world. And therefore, powerful states, wherever they are on the globe, will have some impact on other regions. And there will be an interchange of influences and uh, attempts to uh, uh, influence the way uh, countries behave. But we have a moment now which Middle Eastern peoples could seize, it seems to me, in the aftermath of this American failure uh, to uh, run their own affairs. In order to run their own affairs, they have to settle enormous conflicts um, that are um, dividing them. Notably, I don't mean by this the conflict with Israel. That is intimately tied to outside an outside power or outside powers, and that's not the conflict I'm referring to here. The conflicts I'm referring to here are the conflicts between Sunnis and Shias and between extremism, particularly Sunni extremism, and more moderate forms of Islam and political discourse, either secular or religious. These are things they've got to settle. Um, the Americans, in a sense, in a completely 
cockeyed way, have tried to settle, but they haven't succeeded. Um, and whether they can even contribute in a secondary way to the solution of these problems is very open to question. Uh, and it's certainly open to question that uh, we British, in the wake of the Americans, have much to say in these matters. I'm not saying we have nothing to say in these matters, but the ball is, as it were, now in the Middle Eastern court. Um, whatever has happened, whatever the Americans have done, however quickly or more intensely they've brought on these uh, violent forces that are pulling this region uh, apart, the people in, in that region have to do something about it. And for the first time, I think, they might be able to say to themselves, well, if we try to do something about it, we are not going to be necessarily and instantly stymied by outsiders. America is tired and fed up. Others are weakened. And the new powers on the scene, the Russians, well, the old power on the scene, the Russians are relatively weak. The Chinese and the Indians are also never going to have the kind of American position in the Middle East. So there is a there is a historic moment that the peoples of the Middle East need to seize. That's how I would see the situation now. It would, isn't it um, difficult, given the fact there are 150,000 American soldiers in Iraq, that the United States supplies the regimes of virtually every government in the region with um, weapons to control their populations, and Israel is also there keeping its neighbors in line, although they, they failed to keep them in line this summer, but they still would like to go on playing that role. So it, it is quite difficult for the peoples of the Middle East to exercise self-determination when so many decisions and so much power uh, is exercised over their heads without, their, and without them being consulted. What you say is true. On the other hand, numbers, scale, uh, bases, all that kind of thing are not necessarily to be you know, counted, taken at face value. After all, at the time of Suez, Britain had soldiers all over the Middle East, immense numbers of soldiers. I mean, they may not have been that well equipped and, and so on, but it was a very imposing facade, and yet it didn't mean much. And the fact that uh, Britain succeeded militarily in a sense, in a small sense, um, in, in dealing with the Egyptians, landed in Egypt, took part of the canal and so on, uh, there was no military defeat, um, uh, didn't mean anything either. Um, it, the sinews had weakened. I think American power is not as weakened. Uh, I'm not sure um, uh, I would want it to be as weakened, um, but it is weakened, and therefore the mere count of how many advisors are in which ministers in the Egyptian government, how many uh, military attaches are working the, the area, what the CIA is doing, that doesn't necessarily measure American influence now. In, 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 um, in the book, uh, one, of, one, of my, one of my favorite uh, statements in it is, comes from Nirad C. Chowdhury, who wrote in 1959, only dying empires are kicked, living ones never. He was referring to the British, but um, could we now say that the Iraqis are kicking a dying American empire? Well, you and I differ a bit on this <laughs> part of it. Um, I think there's an element uh, in which people sense that the, the unipolar American moment, which is what it's sometimes called now, is coming to an end. Uh, I don't think people think that American power is, is going to diminish anything like as, uh, as, as much as British power diminished or was seen to diminish uh, as a result of Suez, but it's going to reduce. Um, it is going to reduce, and that is a fact which everybody else is going to have to deal with. You can no longer, I think in the future, you'll no longer be able to blame the Americans uh, for things that go wrong or expect them to rescue you or come to your aid in the same way. You, you also, um, you quote uh, Richard Crossman, who was um, speaking a great deal about Arab democracy as opposed to Western interests. And he finally decided that he would abandon any pretense of thinking that democracy could exist in the Arab world, and, and but, but the West must act to preserve its own interests. This is a theme that, that lives on now, is one of, one of two strands of, of thought. Uh, if, if you could elaborate on that. I think you turn these things upside down and examine them rather mm -hmm. carefully, like a possibly faulty saucepan. Um, 
it's 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 one thing to say and to say that the West has proven itself on the whole uninterested in a consistent way in democracy in the in democracy and human rights in the Middle East. Uh, it's another thing to say that um, the West both on the right and the left, wrongly assume some sort of primacy in deciding these, que these questions. You know, we're going to fix democracy in the Middle East or, or we're not going to fix democracy in the Middle East. Um, a more modest position all along, and certainly now, that if it's going to be fixed, it's going to be fixed by them. And if we can help, we may, if we think it appropriate and not counterproductive, would be proper. And and what is the Western reaction, what, what should it be and what, what is it likely to be when on those rare occasions when people are allowed to express their opinions, those opinions um, are against what the West perceives of it as its interest. As example, when, when the Palestinians elected a Hamas government. Yeah, well. Or uh, when the Algerians almost elected an Islamist government. Um, uh, what I can say about that is that um, people can make mistakes. Um, the voters or the, the Western powers? The voters can make mistakes. Mm. They do make mistakes. Uh, and I think, uh, the, you know, it would be my view as, as a Westerner that the Algerians made a mistake when they elected the government. It would also be my view that the Algerian government made a mistake when it negated uh, it negated that vote, and, and, and that led to years of suffering and conflict which could have been avoided or at least minimized. So it's a, compli it's a complicated story. Uh, I, I wouldn't accept for a minute that simply because uh, a majority of people at some particular moment vote for some particular uh, group that that you know, is absolutely a sacred decision. Um, it, it, we Even in the West? In any country. Mm -hmm. I mean, at anywhere, uh, there's no protection against folly. Um, so we have to cope with democratic decisions because they have a special resonance. Um, we don't have any particular right to reverse them, but we don't necessarily have to approve of them. That would be my reaction to that. And uh, um, you quote Lord Milner on popular government in Egypt in the late 19th century. He said, the people neither comprehend it nor desire it. And later, later in the book, or actually at the next page, you talk about Bush's, George Bush's elevation of democracy and human rights, saying it seems admirable, but it's arrogant. So maybe you could tell me in what ways it's admirable, but in what ways it's arrogant, and, and how it also differs from Lord Milner's view. Well, <laughs> well it's not, they're not exactly apples and apples, but... Um, problem with Milner was that he was a man who probably was up, he was probably at bottom quite doubtful about democracy in Britain <laughs> um, never, never mind in Egypt um, the truth some, obviously lies somewhere in between that, that the, the notion that western models of democracy can simply be transferred to non-western societies is clearly troublesome I mean it's clearly problematic uh, they they don't necessarily transfer democracy must be in a form that's homegrown um, and transfers often go wrong I mean these are these are banalities but I mean obviously this is the case uh, the problem with what um, the American president has to say is that in the most simplistic way he announces that we are going to give up this awful thing we've been doing, which is uh, uh, um, uh, compromising with dictatorship and authoritarianism and, and, and abuses of human rights in the, in the Middle East, and we're going to be for democracy. And then he defines democracy, in effect, as a, as a society which will freely choose what is, it, what is acceptable to the United States. And, and that, of course, is... You know, That's where the arrogance comes in. That's where the arrogance comes in. In, uh, there seem to be two doctrines that you've detected in um, Western policy in terms of war making in the region. One is preemptive war, which, which George Bush uh, 
initially used as his justification for the war in Iraq, and the other is humanitarian intervention, which he subsequently used. But in a way, aren't they both, well, one preemptive war was made illegal at Nuremberg, but even though it was still, still used as a justification, aren't they both um, simply the covers for doing what you want to do anyway, which is to go in and tell, tell people what governments they need to have in your interest? Um, I think uh, one refers to Hemingway who said before war is anything else one must remember it is a crime <laughs> um, uh, it's not only a crime it's a very complicated human activity uh, that uh, it d doesn't, it doesn't lend itself to a very easy, uh, easy definition um, so I think uh, intervention for moral reasons, intervention for reasons of national interest, uh, or intervention for the kind of irrational reasons that we may uh, feel operated both at Suez and in the decision to go into Iraq is always a mixture. And I'm disinclined to think that there are genuinely two categories. There are, there are, there have been interventions in the 90s that were broadly speaking um, altruistic or going towards that end of the scale. They always include an element of, of self-interest. No country risks its soldiers or its reputation for no reason at all or simply to help strangers or others. On the other hand, uh, almost no uh, military enterprise is unaccompanied by some thought or some defense on moral grounds. Uh, so I don't actually see two categories in quite the way you put it. I will say this, that um, Iraq was obviously seen by Tony Blair as within that tradition of liberal intervention. That's how he justified it to himself. That's how he justified it to the country. Leaving aside the arguments about WMD, uh, which he obviously also believed in, but nevertheless, I think his key defense was we're doing this to get rid of a dictatorship. Uh, we're doing this to undo an oppressive state. Uh, therefore, it was for him in the tradition of liberal intervention. It, it has muddied the waters uh, uh, that of the arguments about whether there is a case for liberal intervention and whether powerful states have that right or that duty. Um, we've all been in both places, I think, in the last 10 or 15 years. We've been in the place where you're saying, why are powerful states not doing something? This is appalling. It's a crime not to do something. And we've been in the place where we say they're doing things that are wrong. They shouldn't be intervening. Yeah. So I think we have got to recognize that complexity. In the book, you say, and I think it's one of the more important things, um, one of the more important observations, um, and it takes up the theme of the book very well, the ultimate parallel with Suez through all the differences is that both the British government in 1956 and the American government in 2003 sensed their control of the region was slipping and both thought they had found a way to reverse that loss of control. But now clearly Britain didn't reverse it, it accelerated it. But has America in any way reversed it? I think not. I think America has, um, has, 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 has undermined its own position in the Middle East. Not totally, but quite significantly. Um, and so the uh, object of the exercise has been entirely unfulfilled um, and is likely to remain so, even if uh, and this is something we've not touched on, even if Iraq in some way recovers its balance with or without American troops there and gets back into a situation where it, it becomes a normal society again, even if that happens, um, what the Americans have done will have undermined their position rather than shore it up. We already, I think, know that. And, and that is the essential similarity between the two projects. They were intended to reinforce control and they have, in fact, undermined it. I know um, in traveling around the region, and as, you, as you do, that the one thing that everyone agrees with, including dissidents outside from various Arab countries, is that they do not want an American intervention having seen what happened in Iraq. Whereas in the, in the Iraqi case, there were, there were many Iraqi exiles who were very much urging the United States to get involved. Now exiles are not doing this because they're hearing from people at home that the Iraqi model is not acceptable anywhere. No one 
in Syria wants it, no one in Lebanon wants it, nobody in Saudi Arabia wants an American invasion to impose an Iraqi model of development. Well, they're not, they're not surprising. <laughs> not, <laughs> so that, I think that reinforces your point that the, that the American grip is, is slipping and the American model is not, not so desirable. But um, one needs emphasizing as well, Charlie, is that, that what's happened to Iraqi society uh, is not, uh, and I, we were at this point earlier on, is not, in my view anyway, um, you know, simply the product of American action. It was something coming to Iraq anyway. Um, the Americans brought it on before it would have happened, um, and they and they and they they probably intensified it, or at least it can be argued they intensified it. This was going to happen anyway to Iraq, and it was going to have to be dealt with by Iraqis and by Arabs and Iranians and Turks and Kurds, and that I think we have to bear in mind. Uh, the Americans created a framework, the current framework in, this, in which this conflict is being worked out. They created it and squeezed it and maybe made it much more explosive than it might otherwise have been, but it was there already. Well, of course, the, the, the common theme of Iraqi history since Iraq came into being in 1920 has been outside imposition of its borders, of its rules of engagement, of its form of governance, of its actual leaders from 1920 until very recently, and now, and now again. Um, True. The state, no, but the state has, has had very little chance to uh, exercise its self-determination. But even with that, there has not been, until now, until the pressure of the American occupation and the two positions that the leaderships of the Sunnis and the Shiites took yeah. in reaction to that occupation, there has not been Sunni Shia fighting in, uh, in Iraq. Even, even when Khomeini was calling for regime change in Baghdad and calling on Shiites to rise up against him, there was not Sunni Shiite fighting. The only time w when they finally did have a rebellion, the, the Shiites and the Kurds did rise against Saddam. Very few Sunnis did, but they didn't fight each other in that, in that short period in, in 1991 when you and I were there. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that America, by, by putting so much pressure on, on the state with this invasion and this occupation in the, in the way that, it, it, that it's been conducted, that it has, it has, this, this, this fake state couldn't take the pressure and it cracked. And it wasn't just something that was inevitable in, in, or inherent in, in Mesopotamian, the Mesopotamian makeup. Well, I think we differ a bit there, Charlie. Um, I would say that... No, glad we finally disagree about something because I'm trying to get a little debate going. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that although, and this is somewhat beyond the scope of the book and certainly beyond my pay grade in terms of knowing uh, a great deal about Iraq, but I would say my own feeling is, is that um, within the kind of fixing of the form of government in, in Iraq, which is obviously the case by the British, there was also a fixing of the relationship between the two communities. Uh, that's obvious. The Sunnis were put in charge. Um, the Sunnis came to regard uh, Iraq as their state to the point where, as, as one reads and understands, many Sunnis actually believed, even after the American invasion, uh, that they were the majority. Uh, they, they were the numerical majority in the state. So, so lost as in Le Lebanon had become the true statistics. Uh, so unaware were people in the major communities of the real balance of uh, numbers uh, between, between them. So this sense that Iraq is a sunny possession, I think, is something very important and critical to the present, uh, present situation. It is, in a sense, yes, the creation of the British, who ensconced it, um, but it's also very internalized within the, not only the Iraqi Sunni community, but within Sunnis throughout the Middle East. When this shifted because of the Iranian Revolution, when the balance shifted because of the Iranian Revolution, I think something was set in train which we're now seeing the full consequences of. Exacerbated, complicated, and no doubt intensified by the American and British uh, invasion of Iraq but nevertheless happening anyway. Um, something else you say t 
towards the, in the book is um, towards the end of the book. The Middle East is a region whose peoples are resistant to outside interference precisely because they have endured so much of it. Um, so much more than elsewhere? Yes, I think so. Because there's never been a true an emancipation in, in the Middle East, with the exception of Turkey. Um, there, there has never been a moment, there seemed to be a moment in the wake of Suez when that was about to happen. But for a variety of reasons, everybody knows, it didn't really happen. I think the extent to which uh, Middle Eastern societies have been under some sort of consistent outside control can be greatly exaggerated. But certainly they've been under more outside control than other parts of the non-Western world. And so true em emancipation has not come to, 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 the, to, the, to Middle Eastern societies as a whole region. It's come to Iran now, um, and perhaps it will come to all the other major states in time. Is that because of oil? No, I don't think it's only because of oil. I think it's because partly of the jigsaw nature of the, uh, of the region. Uh, it, it also, uh, I, I feel tentative in saying this, the business of blame, apology, um, the idea that it's the outside that controls and is responsible for the things that go wrong has become so embedded. On the, on the Western side, the idea has become embedded that we must control. It's important we must control for oil, if uh, amongst many important reasons, but certainly past, the first amongst many important reasons. And on the Middle Eastern side, the idea has become entrenched that we are controlled all the time. I think both are wrong. The West has less need of control than it has felt it uh, has needed, less need of control. And the uh, Middle Eastern societies have been, in fact, less controlled. In fact, their, their history is a very unruly. They've not been obedient uh, satellites of the United States or the Soviet Union or of anybody else. So to some extent, there's a kind of, uh, a kind of template in which West and Middle East have seen one another. We're trying to control you, you're trying to control us, which has which uh, prevented people from saying, never mind uh, that there are these outside influences. We can and still should make our own decisions. Um, and prevented the West, on the other hand, from saying, never mind that there are things in the Middle East which endanger our interests or might be problematic for us. Um, we don't actually need to have, nor can we achieve the kind of micromanagement of uh, other societies in another culture that we seem, uh, you know, uh, we seem to have established as a, a kind of aim. So uh, on both sides, I see a kind of obsession with control. I, I it needs to be discarded. I want to read one more sentence which struck me because I think it's, it's um, right, but anyway, it, it, it's from towards the end of the book. Iraq however, how, Iraq, however the war ends, could turn out to be just part of the story of how, of, how, of how the long era of Middle East dependency may finally be drawing to a close. Now, I'm not going to ask you a question about that. I'm, I'm now on, on that because we've, we've gone over the ground of the book. We've, we have, we've left out the Israelis a bit, but I hope you'll ask questions about that because a, a kind of myth um, about Israel and its usefulness and, and its um, efficiency of the army in an, in, in an attack mode across the Sinai became uh, very important for in Western decision making later. Very important ideas as well. But I want to open up because it's about it's about time I open it up to questions from all of you. Uh, if you please identify yourself, they'll bring a microphone to you, and uh, you could ask questions uh, of Martin, not of me. And uh, please. <coughs> I was, uh, if you could identify yourself, please. Uh, my name is Abdul Rupane. I was a young man in university in Mumbai when this 56 uh, came up. And I think uh, uh, there was a great deal of uh, sympathy for pan-Arabism and, of course, the Nehru's relations with Nasser and Nkrumah and all that. But what uh, impression lives in my mind uh, to this day is the deception lies 
practice by uh, the cabinet at that time, and also egged on by the newspaper, by probably, I don't know about Manchester Guardian at that time, uh, but I think they were egging on, you see, eh? just as it's happening now in case of Iraq and the abdication by the parliament, uh, the, all the MPs who are eunuch, uh, behaving like eunuch. And I still feel that there is certain amount of intrinsic hatred of Arab in the British psyche, barring Arabist and some other people. But there seems to be a pejorative word used, dirty I, Arab and that sort of thing. I, have to I wonder if there is something to do with that. Well, uh, um, uh, obviously, uh, there's an element of, uh, there was then and uh, uh, no doubt remains now, an element of racism, if that's what you mean, or anti-Arab, or anti-Middle Eastern feelings. I'm not sure they're, in my view, they're not, not necessarily critical. Uh, there, there's racism in the Middle East too, um, not least between Middle Eastern peoples themselves. Um, and uh, as far as that kind of sense of solidarity in, in the, what we came to call the third world is concerned, it had, uh, it was real, but it, it also had certain spurious elements. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're, question was, but um, I suppose I would say, I suppose I would say that, um, hmm, I'm losing the thread here, <laughs> I, I suppose I would say that the racism doesn't matter that much, it's, it's not critical, what matters is the fantasy which drives policy, what matters is the irrationality which makes governments do things that are not achievable, and that's the critical question. Yeah, a question at the back. The microphone's, on. The microphone's on its way there. Hi, I'm, I'm Tony Borden from the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. And Martin, it's really great to know that your summer was worth it, all that time in the cabin. Um, this seems to be a, a discussion about comparative wars, which is always a very tricky thing, and it's interesting that you compare Iraq with Suez because you're Ara comparing a war that America's involved with, with, with a war that America has hardly heard about in terms of you know, current public resonance. And since you spent all this time, I wondered if you could just, this is not a Paxmanite question, but a sort of more reflective question, if you could, having spent the summer thinking about it, uh, use your prism to reflect on the dynamic or the, 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 the war calculations, the, the comparative wars that do matter in American politics now, which is the Second World War in Vietnam. Because when you walk around Washington, that's what you think about if you think about America as Second World War, and much of the Bush generation thinks in those terms despite their age, uh, some reaching that age, some well below it, they think of America as liberators and need to assert, them, assert themselves. And Vietnam obviously gives a very different lesson. And I wonder if you have anything more complex than that really typical dynamic of Second World War, this should work, Vietnam, it won't work. How did you reflect on it as you thought about that among other wars? Well, of course, the long shadow over all of all this is Munich. Um, and both for Britain and America, the idea that if Hitler had been opposed effectively, uh, the Second World War would not have happened, or if it had happened, it would have been fought on terms uh, fought on terms that were much more to our advantage, is, is very much part of the argument between hawks and doves in both countries, in both the Suez situation and in the Iraq situation the way in which Churchill constantly comes up, the way in which their references to the 30s constantly come up suggests that. I think many of these parallels are false, nevertheless. The, the interesting thing about the United States is it, it, its exceptionalism. It, it saw what had happened to Britain at Suez, it saw what had happened to France in Vietnam, and it said to itself, this can't happen to us because we're smarter and we're bigger and we will not suffer the same kind of defeats, problems, and consequences that these two powers, um, uh, these two powers met before us. We'll do it. We'll use different methods. And in any case, we have the weight to, prev to prevail in the way they did not. Of course, that was a reasonable reading of the comparative power 
of the United States and, and Britain and, and France in 1956. It remains the case that America goes against the lessons of history because it thinks it's so much bigger than any other power that had to tackle these things in the past that it can prevail. That, in a way, is Rumsfeld's problem, that somehow Americans can do what others cannot. That would be my answer to that. Okay, next question. Here's Sham. And then you. Uh, my name is Hisham Ed Salih. I'm from Lebanon. <coughs> Uh, in your uh, extensive experience in the Middle East and uh, writing about the Middle East and reporting the Middle East, wouldn't you attribute the policy of the British as well as the Americans' uh, policy in the Middle East and the creation of the State of Israel had, had really affected and induced the, the Sunni uh, I would say, extremism to come forward and rise? Well, it's obviously, it's obviously had something to do with it. The question is not whether it's, it's, uh, it's, the question is not whether it's an important factor. The question is, is it the critical factor? I don't have a, an answer to that. I, I would say myself that I doubt that uh, Israel, the existence of Israel, the failure of the West uh, and the failure of the United States in particular uh, to put pressure on Israel uh, to bring about a settlement that would be acceptable to most, if not all, but certainly to most Arabs. I don't think that myself, I don't think that is the critical factor in the rise of Sunni extremism. It is a major factor, but I think in the end it's secondary. Uh, I think the primary factor is uh, the emergence of groups which saw uh, failing governments, um, which saw um, governments they deemed to be irreligious, wish to replace them by governments they deemed to be religious. Um, in the process, they no doubt expected uh, that Israel would be dealt with, but I don't think it was primary. I don't think it is primary. Hisham has a quick follow-up, and then, and then out. <laughs> Typical. But I, I feel that... Uh, the creation of the State of Israel had <clears throat> let a lot of people uh, uh, say that their governments came on the ticket of, uh, you know, trying to reverse the creation of Israel, and that's why they they wanted really to come forward. I think that the the, the creation of Israel is a major factor in the rise of Sunni Muslims. Extremism, and actually, a book was written in 1960, uh, saying that the, uh, the 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 governments of the, the failing of the governments of the Middle East in addressing the creation of Israel has really given the Muslims and or, and especially the Sunni extremism to take over. I mean, to come forward and rise. Well, obviously, the failure to, do to, the failure to deal with Israel um, was a source of, of disillusion um, uh, right from the beginning. Um, and uh, the, the argument within the Arab world, as to, within the Muslim world generally, as to whether or not um, a halfway house in terms of accepting Israel under certain terms, the terms we know about, we've spent uh, decades discussing, and people in the Middle East spent decades discussing, has been disillusioning for many people in the greater Middle East who wanted a clearer and more absolute solution. But again, I think that the failure with Israel is only one aspect of the, of the situation against which Sunni extremists are reacting. So we disagree. Quite a question here. Thanks. Um, David Savright, I, but firstly, I just want to respond to the gentleman there's uh, suggestion that the British are intrinsically anti-Arab. Um, I don't think the British have really thought about it much until recently, but certainly speaking as a soldier who served in the Arab army and a diplomat who's been uh, in an Arab country, in my career, the, British, the institution, the foreign office and the army, were very pro-Arab and had a romance with Arabia. 
Um, but that wasn't really the question I wanted to ask. But, you know, I was going to pick up on your point that um, the British ensconce the Sunnis in Iraq. Surely the Ottoman Emperor um, ensconced the Sunni power in Iraq, not, not the British. I think that's yeah. I agree with that en entirely. The, the British uh, didn't reverse the situation as they found it uh, in Iraq. They simply continued it. Um, and also, surely, and reinforced uh, in, in those days, the Shias hadn't, the population hadn't multiplied so much. So the balance of Sunnis and Shias may have been different in the 1920s. It may well have been different. Uh, I don't, I, have, I can't speak to that, but it, it, it makes some sense. It probably was different. Yeah, fair enough. Parenthetically, I just throw in that, in fact, the Shia under the Ottomans, the Shia and Basra were roughly autonomous as under their own Naqibs and their own leaders. But once Basra was merged with the two northern provinces, then they, lo they lost all that and they felt the loss of that and subsequently um, felt much, much greater resentment against a Sunni, local Sunni hegemony. Everyone was willing to accept it from the Sultan, but not from, the, not from fellow Arabs. Um, anyway, next question from uh, Moshe Mahoub right here. Yes, I'm Moshe Mahoub, an Israeli. My uh, classmates were killed in the Mitla Pass uh, under Sharon. But my question 1556. Is not in 1956. That was the, the Battle of the Mitla Pass. But my question is not about this uh, uh, two, uh, last war, but two, but about the next war. There are two logics. There's the logic of the uh, uh, prudent. If you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And there's the logic of the gambler. If you lose, double your stake, hoping to win. Uh, this this uh, uh, is relevant to the war on Iran, which is being mooted. What is your bet? Which logic will prevail? Um, are we speaking from the point of view of the gambler that is the United States or the gambler that is Israel or both? Well, they are probably impossible they're, to separate. They're entangled, <laughs> yeah. Well, my guess, my hope and guess is that um, uh, there will be no doubling of the money. Uh, I think that uh, the United States is chastened and... Um, and anxious about the future. I think uh, an attack on Iran is uh, unlikely in the near future or even in the longer future. I think the United States uh, may well, even this administration, much as it may dislike it, and may well already have accepted the idea that Iran will become a nuclear power. Uh, and I hope only that it can be halted at a sort of um, bomb in the basement uh, level. Um, so I am hopeful that um, there will be no American assault on Iran. Leslie Palmer, um, you've talked between the two of you quite a lot about America, but bringing it back to Britain um, and its role uh, currently in the Middle East, why, Martin, do you think that after all these sort of decades and indeed centuries of British experience around the world. Why do you think that Tony Blair has had his Suez moment? And what do you think are the institutional implications for Britain's future involvement in the Middle East? <laughs> Thank you, Leslie. That, that speaks to the second set of things. Uh, the, there are the parallels and then there are the connections. I think the reason we uh, were with the Americans and are with the Americans in Iraq is a story of obligation uh, and uh, debt. Um, I, I, think it, I think it possible to argue that had it not been for American aid to Britain in the Falklands, had that gone differently, we would not have been there in 1991 in the way that we were. Once we were there in 1991, and once we got involved with the United States in the task of containing Iraq and also Iran, but in particular Iraq, once we became the, uh, we and the Americans became the solitary uh, enforcers 
of sanctions uh, and air, aerial punitive um, attacks on, on Iraq, it was almost inevitable we were going to, if there was a further development or intensification of the conflict with Iraq, which I think now is properly seen as a 15 or 16 year war rather than two wars with something in between that we don't quite define, a kind of limbo. It was a long conflict. Once we were in it, in that shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder way, we were going to stay. I think a Tory uh, prime minister would almost certainly have made the same decision. I think another Labour prime minister might have made the same decision. So I go beyond Tony Blair uh, uh, and to feel that this was probably the logic of our relationship with the United States, of our debts to the United States, um, would have put us where we ended up, even with different personalities. That would be my reaction. Tim Llewellyn? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Martin, this is Tim Llewellyn. He didn't identify yeah, as Tim Llewellyn. Tim Llewellyn. I'm a former BBC Middle East correspondent. I, I wasn't going to say anything um, because I broadly agree. I sort of broadly agree with what Martin says about Sirius and its link with Iraq, but I, I, I really do have to break faith with what you've just said. You made a kind of seamless ride between the Falklands and our debt to the Americans and Tony Blair's obligation uh, to America, as you allege it, uh, for us to take part in this uh, adventure. You know, in 1990, it was totally different. Can, can we move it to the right seamless the question? Well, the seamless, what I'm asking you about is how can you, how can you justify your argument that in 1991, when James Baker, the Americans had made an extraordinary effort and given Saddam Hussein days, weeks, months to get himself off the hook and he had invaded another country and the United Nations was involved, all sorts of efforts were made. You know, the British joined in what was then a real genuine coalition with UN backing to go in to free a, a, a country called Kuwait. I mean, okay, there are lots of spurious arguments to go around that, but it's, you cannot make that link between, you know, buttering up the Falklands, but, you know, because of the Falklands, and then suddenly, you know, well, waking up one morning. We're going to have to point this towards a question mark. Okay, okay. Fine. All right. Um, it's not so much the uh, it's not so much the British uh, role in that coalition, which, as you say, was much more respectable in terms of international law, the United Nations, and so on, as was what was got together in 2003. It's not so much that. It's what happened afterwards, when the coalition fell apart, dissolved, largely dissolved, and everybody peeled off until only the Americans and the British were left in effective enforcement of what were, in fact, international sanctions, rightly or wrongly, whatever you think of them. Uh, it became a purely Anglo-American affair. The French were quickly out, um, and what had originally been a genuinely international coalition during the war itself ceased to be an international coalition. It became a purely Anglo-American affair. That's when our obligations to the United States kicked in, but they also kicked in earlier when Margaret Thatcher chose to send a very, very large force by British standards. The soldier here knows how much of our very limited uh, military resources were dispatched in 1991. It was a huge bite of what we had, and the same again. So we were into the hilt because of that commitment in the first place, and then we were into the hilt because of our staying on with the Americans afterwards. All this reflects a lot of things. First of all, our interests in the Gulf. Secondly, working together so closely with the Americans in the United Nations, which makes us you know, sort of so intimately related to them in terms of joint choices about what to try and get the international community to agree to. It's this, it's this framework, it's this framework that uh, is this context which puts us so close to the Americans. And once we're on that track, and I think we're on it by 1991, it's very difficult to get off. And I'm not sure any prime minister I can imagine would have got off. I mean, it's counterfactual, so you never know, but that's my, I feel it. Could, could, can I just briefly ask 
because it, it raises a question in my mind. Could this prime minister or some other prime minister have privately said to George Bush over, we don't think this is a very good idea? Yes. I think what Tony Blair said was something in between. I, I think he said, I don't think this is a very good idea unless we also do X and Y. And I think we know that he, 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 he outlined that X and Y, got a kind of generalized, reluctant assent in principle, and never, then never got his X and Y. Uh, yes, a question here, please. Uh, Dennis Michel, I'm a member of Parliament. Can I just thank Martin for the literally millions of words I've read in Iraq for that one illuminating metaphor that this has been a continuing war since 1990-1991? Because actually that clarifies an awful lot because the most, the most, the most damning WMD indictment I ever heard was not in the famous dossier, but was Robin Cook repeatedly in the House of Commons before mobilising the Royal Air Force to start the attacks. And this, this concept of a continuing process actually is incredibly helpful. But Martin, I just want to go back to the Suez book and Suez itself. What was the role of France? I'm sorry, I, I haven't read the book yet, looking forward to it. But in France, I, I, we're obsessed with Suez. Uh, yours must be you know, what, the hundredth book, yeah. maybe? No, 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 the best. But in France, it's a kind of almost a non-story. It's a minor story. It was celebrated the 50th anniversary this summer, almost as folklorique pictures of the French troops. And it's not a dynamic of politics in, in the country. Who, I mean, France was between Dien Bien Phu and Algeria. What, what, drove, what drove France forward? Was France in the lead? Was Britain following? What was France's role in all of this in 56? Well, Dennis, I think that uh, the French were the ones who learned the lesson of Suez most completely. The British didn't learn the lesson because within a couple of years we were doing the same sort of thing. The French learned the lesson that their whole worldview and in particular the French army's worldview, had been askew. They understood that because of what happened in Algeria. I, 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 don't, I, I don't subscribe to the view that the French uh, then chose the European path. Of course they did. That's a different argument. I think the French then simply shed. They shed their intensely anti-communist uh, uh, understanding of the world, which had informed their their uh, ideas about Vietnam, inform their ideas about Alger Algeria, about the Middle East as a whole, and about the Third World as a whole, they junked it all because they deemed it to have been quite irrational and not soundly based. Uh, and, they, and, th and that lay behind the shift in French policy towards the Middle East, obviously, of course, the settlement on Algeria and the exit from Algeria, and the whole shift in the French attitude to the Middle East. So the French... As you know, the French, you know better than I because you're a French expert, but I mean, the French went on in Algeria to fight a war very effectively. They won it, sort of, militarily. They lost it politically. That drove home the lesson that they had got it wrong. Um, and so I think that, for me, is the difference. The British didn't change that much because of Suez, really. And the Americans didn't change that much of Suez because of Suez, really. They, they merely thought, because they were stronger and because they contemplated different techniques, i.e. not the direct use of troops, which we finally came around to again in Iraq, but uh, rather more covert means or using small numbers of troops in support of regimes rather than to try and topple regimes, they thought they would carry on with what was essentially a British policy in the Middle East in partnership with the British. The French turned around and had a very different idea. And they repudiated the worldview of the early 50s, particularly the military worldview of the early 50s. They discarded it. It was a good thing to do. Hi, I'm Greg Neal from the BBC. Um, Martin, uh, one quick point. I think there is a discontinuity which um, you may have mentioned, and that is that domestically the impact of Suez in some ways was traumatic 
uh, but short-lived. After all, in 1959, the election, and I was studying this morning the Labour Party manifesto for that year, which lambs the Conservatives for being breaking international law, lying to the House, etc., it, it didn't register in terms of domestic politics at the next election. One suspects that Iraq, however, will have a continuing legacy uh, after Tony Blair steps down because, of course, there will most likely still be some kind of British involvement in Iraq then. But my question is one of, in terms of, we've been talking about history here. What do you think the actual historical benefit was to British policymaking? After all, various people within Whitehall and within Westminster drew different lessons from uh, the Suez affair. Mrs. Thatcher, for example, famously said that her lessons were never do anything without the American support and agreement, uh, never do anything without it being internationally legal, and once you've started, never stop. Um, but there is a much uh, more broad range of reactions within uh, Whitehall and Westminster policymakers. How do you think the lessons of Suez were absorbed to the effect that they actually, we can still see them in play today? Well, I suppose the first thing to say is the obvious, which is that because Suez was aborted, um, there was no lengthy, there was no occupation, there was no, uh, you know, there were no casualties coming in, rolling in month after month. There was no uh, political failure in Egypt, as would seem likely to have happened had the British occupied and attempted to set up a, a government there or attempted to uh, sustain a government in Egypt which was pro-Western or pro-British under those circumstances. So. That's one reason why it slipped away quite quickly. I, it also slipped away, in my view, quite quickly because of uh, British capacity for denial. Um, we didn't like what had happened, and we didn't want to think about it very much. So, so it slipped away in that way. I don't think, though, at decision-making levels, uh, anything much was learned by Suez immediately. Macmillan, who had been the most hawkish, as everybody knows, uh, almost the most hawkish of uh, Eden's ministers, um, uh, was continued to be hawkish. In 1958, he even tried to, uh, perhaps not very seriously, but nevertheless, w had the thought that um, the, uh, the dispatch of troops to Jordan and Lebanon might be transformed into a big rollback operation. Uh, it shows, it, if it wasn't a practical proposition, it shows, in, in a way, the way his mind went that he would have liked to have had such a rollback if it could have been agreed with the Americans. It didn't happen. But I don't, I don't think the British did change, um, except to understand that um, they needed the Americans and they needed to square anything they wished to do with the Americans. And therefore, and th that's the difference with the French. The French seriously changed. The British didn't change. They did change later on Israel. And that's when they diverged from, obviously, we know this, they, they changed, not that much, but enough to, to see a lot of clear water, certainly on the Edward Heath, between the British position on that central conflict and the American position. Uh, and I, we, were, we were parting company in the Middle East, the Americans and the British, amiably, but with continuing cooperation in the Gulf and a continued quasi-common stake in the Iranian in the royal, in the monarchical regime in Iran. We had that, but we were nevertheless parting company. What brought us back together were things outside of the Middle East, I think. One thing inside the Middle East, our interests, our British interests in the Gulf, which were intimately entwined with America's difficult relationships and what, who it could supply what to. We were making money in the Gulf because of certain restraints or constraints on American commercial activity, and that left us with a kind of time warped position in the Gulf. That was the internal thing as far as we were concerned. We, we had debts in the Gulf to Kuwait in particular and to other Gulf states. And the outside thing was American help in the Falklands. And then the further outside thing was American help in the Balkans. And that weighed on Tony Blair. Um, any other questions? Um, Chris Muller. Uh, Chris Muller, a member of parliament. Martin, when, uh, how quickly should the Americans get out of Iraq and what will happen when they do? Mm, finally, a question. <laughs> we, it's really a hard one, Chris. <laughs> we should 
consult their interests before we consult our own. That may be, seem a cop-out, but that is, would be my guide. It, the worry I have is that just as we consulted our interests, above all when we went in, we are going to consult our interests when we go out. We need to think about them and not us. One last question from the floor. Thanks. You spoke earlier. If you could identify yourself. Sorry, it's Emily Cloak. I couldn't hear you. Sorry. Emily Cloak. You spoke of it being um, perhaps a historic time now in which states in the Middle East could act to become stronger and perhaps more resistant to foreign intervention. While it's a very vast, vast region and the states have very um, internal complexities, how do you feel broadly that they might act to do so and how the United States would react to that given particularly how important the region is from an economic and strategic perspective? I think there needs to be uh, a, a, a major process of settlement between the leading Sunni states and the leading Shia state over the future of Iraq. Um, I think there has to be a compact between Sunnis and Shias uh, in which the new balance of power between uh, the, these two major groups in the Muslim world is recognized and agreed. Um, uh, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, that certainly will in, could involve and should involve um, uh, uh, involvement in the uh, internal affairs of Iraq or in attempting to manage or help manage the internal affairs of Iraq by neighboring states. I don't mean by that this James Baker idea of bringing in the... That seems to me still in the control mode. You know, we bring them in. Uh, we bring in a Shia state, Iran, and we bring in another sort of Shia state um, in the shape of, of Syria, or a, a state that's run by a minority which has Shia connections, however you want to read that. Um, that's, that seems to me uh, still groping after trying to control the process. The states of the region need a major country, part of their number, a fraternal country is imploding in front of their eyes. They have to try and settle it. Their relations with one another are part of the problem. It, what the Americans and the British have done is also part of the problem, but it's not the only part of the problem. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, you can tell by listening to Martin that um, there's, a, there's a very subtle and interesting mind at work and you'll read it in this book and I urge you all to buy this book and if you have any money left over you can buy the paperback next to it which is mine which is cheap <laughs> which is cheaper and uh, and I, I I think that Martin Woolacott is one of those people that even when you disagree with him and I occasionally do you have to listen to him because he's given it very deep thought and he knows what he's talking about. He doesn't write about things he doesn't know. He doesn't, he doesn't pontificate about things. He's not a professional pundit by any means. He is a, a very interesting thinker. And this book is fascinating. And if even those of us who know this region or have lived in this region will learn from it and learn a lot about the past that we thought we knew and learn a lot about the present that we think we know. And I, I, I cannot urge you strongly enough to read this book. And if you can't afford to buy it tonight, get it from your local library and read it. And I think we should all thank Martin and applaud him. Uh, apparently the publisher says it's discounted, so you can probably get a free copy. Anyway, thank you very much, Martin.